who, who said copyright cannot be funny? Copyright can be <laughs> the funniest of topics, of course. Well, thank you for inviting me to share some thoughts and information here. You know, Spaniards are people who like to talk very much around proverbs, uh, other countries, so the languages do it as well, but in Spanish it's, it's very common to use proverbs uh, and metaphors and that stuff. And of course there's one which comes to my mind when I'm going to talk about uh, film literacy here to you, which is you cannot sell honey to the honey maker. Uh, it's a literal translation. No se puede vender miel al colmenero. <clears throat> so the guy who is in charge of all the all the bees uh, is not the guy who's going to be taught by any by, by anyone about about uh, what honey is and how is honey to be produced. So who am I to discuss uh, film literacy with you? Hmm? So um, it's mostly about sharing our experience, sharing what we did in that in that study, and yes, yeah, sharing some considerations on on the present <clears throat> situation and in fact on, on topics which uh, I will start with that with the end uh, topics you should be lobbying about you should be doing advocacy about that's exactly what I would put to you as a homework as a result of this I don't think any I say and probably nothing that will be said today will totally sort out your doubts about uh, the legal interpretation about the legal framework many questions will remain because they are there hmm? And I'm a lawyer as well, and when questions are there, it's not that easy to sort them out. So the best way to sort those questions is to clarify the law. And for that, you need to change the law. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. uh, and to change the law at European level means to have a bit of clarification on this when the new directive is going to be implemented. So I came without slides because at some time, as visual as I am at some moment, <clears throat> the PowerPoint and slides are totally distracting and it restricts the freedom of going into one topic or another. Uh, still, I, I'm going to look into here because I do have, of course, some, some basic ideas, some order in the ideas to share with you. The basis of what I'm sharing, as it has been mentioned a couple of times, but let me recall that, is the result of uh, almost two years' uh, work uh, which was this report on the official name of showing films and other individual content in European schools, obstacles and best practices. Well, that's a project funded by the European Commission, which I had the pleasure to coordinate together with uh, Henning Cambre, the former director of the Danish Film Institute, and José Manuel Pérez Tornero, professor at the University of Barcelona. Those were the, the steering committee. Um, and in terms of project management, we managed the whole thing from Brussels, uh, from this organization I, I ran and I founded called Culture and Media Agency Europe. It's a small consultancy based in Brussels, running EU projects. And among other things, this is a small, a small advertisement for free. Among other things, Kumeriae, uh, Culture and Media Agency Europe, as an acronym, Kumeriae, runs now a wiki platform called Culture Agora, which I strongly recommend to you uh, as a multiplier of the visibility of, of your activities, your workshops, your documents, uh, the things you're spreading. Cultureagora.info, I left a couple of leaflets out there. That's a platform with uh, with some moral support from the European Commission and many other institutions. We are, we are developing multilingual wiki and to put together and to increase the visibility of, of, of activities and content. Well, so this, this organization in Brussels, back to track, we, we developed this um, project to do this research, assuming that a research on media literacy needed to put together at least three elements. One was copyright, obviously, the copyright legal framework. So an essential part of this report is a comparative study of uh, the copyright legal framework of film and education. The second element is a reality uh, check with schools. So the, an essential element of the study was a poll across uh, st uh, schools all around Europe. <clears throat> we counted with that with an association of, uh, of professors. We counted with uh, Les Enfants du Cinéma. Uh, we counted with different people. Part were part of the projects. Others were just approached due in the context of our work. And then the third element uh, was the institutional slash industry element, hmm? uh, which is also, of course, uh, essential here industrial, meaning the film industry as such, and the non-industrial, meaning the, the non-commercial, non but still institutional element, which then includes, of course, all those stakeholders, among the essential part of which are the film archives and film institutes and uh, film museums and cinematechs 
um, different different legal personalities, dif different characters, depending on the country and depending on the legal tradition. But in any case, those institutions who are uh, at the essence of really making this happen. Hmm? So that's also part of the of the analysis. Uh, and the report, may <clears throat> recall that the report, besides or beyond what was an analysis of what is going on, includes a very large annex, which was requested by the Commission, of course, about best practices, going country by country and selecting three, four uh, case studies about how things are done. Well, the result of all that, of course, was like the famous bottle, half full, half empty. Half full. Lots of things are being done. A lot of energy is being spent in film literacy lots of goodwill, and in some cases, amazing results. Not necessarily local everywhere, we discuss some are local, some are national, but definitely not a coherent pan-European policy and definitely not a coherent statewide policy. That's absolutely missing. So when we were saying that in many cases the, the impact of Cinematex is local, among other things, because it's physical, so if children need to go, well, they cannot go to a, to an event. In some cases, <clears throat> no, others have online activities, but then we're moving beyond the pure cinematic when we're considered here. Uh, we are talking then about programs of which cinematics are part of. But in any case, we are, we are talking about an addition of initiatives, some of which have a huge impact in a region, a huge impact in a city, a huge impact in a larger area, but which are still, because of several uh, difficulties, which we mention and we describe, um, which are not as effective as they could be. And some have to do, the obstacles have to do with the school curricula. So. I, will, I won't go into the detail of the whole report because I want to focus a little bit more on copyright, as I've been asked to do, but still let's mention a little bit of the rest. So uh, there's, of course, the obstacle related to curricula, hmm? essentially. I mean, if, if uh, cinema is not considered uh, a, an essential part or at least a basic part of educational curricula, well, uh, and as a compulsory subject, then any activity is something between entertainment or a sort of external complementary. And that, of course, has very practical consequences in terms of the use of space, in terms of the time dedicated by teachers, because it's an extra time, it's not part of the normal job, it's something they're doing pro bono, as <laughs> say the lawyers. So it has a lot of consequences, of course, if, if, if uh, film literacy is not included in the, in the curricula, there are other, other obstacles related to the ignorance by teachers. Teachers are not trained, so uh, if they don't know what they can do, if they first, in many cases, they, they are not trained at all about film literacy, so they, they, they have their own goodwill, uh, their own personal training, but uh, it doesn't, it's not, of course, film literacy is not part of what they are teach to teach. You know? So if they don't receive that, how can they transmit if nobody has given that to them? Hmm? So many teachers lack the very basic training for them to manage this, uh, including in some cases the very technical training for them to be able to manage a DVD or, or an online platform. I mean, some teachers are totally out of date of that. Uh, and of course, when we are talking European-wide, uh, if not, you're not talking about the best teachers in Frankfurt, but also in rural areas and also in deep Spain, deep France, deep Germany. That's what we're talking about here, not just those in Berlin, Frankfurt or Barcelona, where this applies differently. So they are not aware of the legal framework either, teachers and schools, they don't know, they don't know what is available for them, nobody has explained them. Uh, not only they don't know the legal framework, they don't even know options which in some cases exist in terms of licensing possibilities, nobody has explained it to them. Mm -hmm. There is, of course, the whole, uh, in terms of difficulties, the whole difficulties related to the copyright, uh, the way the copyright directive is drafted and how it is being implemented, which I will go back to this. In some cases, there are technical difficulties related to equipment, that depends very much from country to country, school to school. Uh, some schools are, are much better in terms of online facilities. Others have the sort of online facilities or internet facilities we all had, you know, uh, some years ago, almost with a modem. Uh, you know, the small, <laughs> the small size, just to have some emails from time to time. And they consider, they will reply that, yes, they are online because they can receive emails, you know, but uh, uh, but that's it. Uh, that's absolutely it. Well, that's not, if, again, if you're... That doesn't work that well. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, there is an, an, an issue which I was personally involved in underlining that as one of the difficulties of lack of communication between the different stakeholders. Uh, as a former politician and former director general of cinema in Spain, and, and, and you know, with this perception, I, I, I 
believe that this was one of the essential elements. I believe there's no policy possible. There's no really action in the public field when all those who can contribute to that don't talk to each other. And now they're not talking to each other. Hmm? For, and it's nobody to blame, or it's not for me to say who's to blame. Hmm? But there's a lot of people doing different things without actually coordinating those efforts. And this has an impact here. I wouldn't say it's the main one, but it's also an element here. And that starts at the political level, when people involved in supporting film from the cultural perspective, those funding film, those promoting film, those uh, in the film uh, institutes, meaning those who are subsidizing, funding, promoting, selling, have a completely different approach to those talking about film and education, if they do it at all, from an educational perspective those running schools, managing schools, training teachers and managing schools. Even at the political level, those two agents, which normally is ministries, but I'm using agents to be even wider because in some cases it's not in industry, in not the ministries, it's the Secretary of State here, the other. There are different schemes depending on the country. They're not talking to each other. France is an exception and still we all consider French a, a fantastic model. Well, it is true that... Uh, uh, those programs related to film literacy in France, uh, for the cinema, it is a joint effort by the Ministry of Education and the CNC, which the CNC at its time it's related to the Ministry of Culture. So it works, but still, it works as much as it works, hmm? because this, I mean, it works in the fact that those those working there they have a sort of dual responsibility and dual oversight by the Ministry of Education and the CNC. And in practical terms, this is not always perfect, but it's still better than nothing. Hmm? But it's definitely not the case in many other countries. So at that level, but also it goes down. The industry is not talking to, or at least not talking enough, perhaps with people like you. Hmm? Uh, and it's not to blame. I'm just stating a fact, which is part of the analysis. Hmm? Uh, when we, part of our work was to go to the European Film Market in Berlin and to spend hours doing a real poll, you know, one by one, huh? with film distributors and film producers. And in many cases, they, in, in some cases, the very fact of having a difficulty to get those meetings said a lot. But in others, uh, large European film distributors said, we are perfectly ready. We want to do more for film literacy. But nobody comes to us. You're the first person who comes to me. Uh, asking about what can we do. So tell me, tell me what am I supposed to do, you know? And you might say, oh no, they are lying, no? they are just money greedy and they will never do. Well, I don't think that's exactly true, huh? at least not for all of them. Hmm? So really, there's, there's, there's truth in the fact that the film industry, which of course, and that's obviously, we put that in writing, but nobody needs to put that in writing because it's obvious, film literacy is not the main objective of a film distribution company. I think we need to start with that. You don't make films just to give them for free to school. Okay, This is a secondary element. Hmm? You don't make films to have them in a film archive at the end of the day. No, they will end in a film archive, but you're not putting your money at risk, looking for a loan, looking for a credit, mortgaging your house uh, as a film producer, thinking that, okay, this will be one day in a film archive and it will be shown to children. No, this is not how it works. This is the film industry is an industry. So they make money out of ideals, out of the wanting to deliver, they make films, sorry, out of conviction, out of wanting to deliver a story, a documentary and so on. But yes, they want to recover that investment. So the first priority is to sell films and the, all, the, the first objective of everybody in the film industry is not exactly film literacy. But when you speak, well, we will have a discussion. I see some revolt here in the first line. Huh? Public money. Mm. Yes, yes, with yes, public there money. There is no industry without public money. There is no industry without public money. There's no cinema without private risk as well. I'm not saying that public money, I'm the last one to say that public money could not be conditioning this more. I'm not saying, I'm just describing that with public money alone, there would not be film industry either. Okay, so that's the only thing I'm saying. Uh, without public money, there wouldn't be, although that applies in some cases because the more it is tax-based, uh, it is tax, but it's first an investment. But anyway, it is absolutely clear. There's no European cinema without public money. That's clear. But there's no European cinema with a private investment either and a private effort. So the only point I'm saying is that indeed 
certain things could be, I mean, the public authorities could be conditioning more that public money to a public social result of what is happening with those films. That's absolutely clear. Part of that is done, more could be done. It's true. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying there is space, there is room for a better collaboration or a better talk among those players. First, first level, those who are decision makers, educational and film industry, they don't talk enough. And second, the different stakeholders around that. And third, of course, yes, the whole legal framework has, has a, an important element here. So that's, that's one of the elements we, we analyze that. Uh, then in, the, in the, whole, the whole report, well, as I say, we, we analyze the whole pedagogical part of this. I'm going to skip that a little bit. You have that in the, in the report. You can find the report as well through this, uh, I mean, you might have it, but if you want to search it through this, through the same platform, of course, we put our own report in the platform I was discussing before, the Culture Agora, uh, you can hold reports there. So what sort of documents, which are somewhere else online, are easy to find in, in that platform if, if they have been uploaded, and that's this is the case. So you have all the results of what the schools have been replying about, for example, one important issue is the limited use of films and the content in schools and the fact that it is mostly used as an ancillary issue. So it is it is rarely used in itself. It is such a support of another of other elements. Um, that it is very often provided with external parties, and that of course is, is you in many cases. So so the the activity is uh, the, the most important part of, of uh, film education in schools would not be happening with without cinematics and film archives. Mm, that's a very clear result, and that's a, that's an obvious thing. You need to not only be happy with and proud of, but you really make you 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 are entitled to make a lot of noise with that you know, because it's it's clear without the cinematics, without the film archives, without in a larger sense the different programs and structures with different formats which which are the whole uh, framework uh, entourage uh, of, of of these activities there would be no film literacy if we just reduce it uh, no film literacy in schools if we just reduce it to those schools which are doing that on their own mm-hmm. so that is that is very clear uh, also in terms of training teachers also in terms of making available the possibility the initiatives are very diverse uh, the structures the mechanism used on, 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 on from one school to another one country to another are very very different so it's not easy to make clear standards about how is film used in in schools um, as i said before there's a very clear image results from this report about the poor training opportunities the difficulties uh, they have in some cases the difficulty of means uh, although that depends very much on the on the on the schools and then um, also it is very clear and i think that we are in transition about the origin which has to do of course with the legal basis so that's why i'm linking one thing of the other the origin of the content which is shown at school what does it come from where what is the the most important origin of what you're going to show to your students well uh, amazingly uh, and not very seriously the most important source is the teacher's private library. Hmm? So it's nothing to do with something institutional or something. It's just the teacher buying a DVD and bringing it to school or, or downloading uh, in whatever conditions, uh, downloading something uh, and, and putting that. That's, that's, that's uh, almost 62% of the answers we, we got on that. Then, yes, there are video libraries in some schools and that changes very much from country to country. There is material available on uh, sub- web, web, open websites. There is, of course, more and more, and that's something we are we, we, we insisted and we recommended as a conclusion material available to schools on closed uh, online environments, uh, so, so closed networks uh, uh, where, where material is made available for them, uh, but that's still very reduced, so sort of central online platforms where, where film literacy material is, is made available to schools, that I think is one of the most important developments which should be pushed through but it is we are, we are still not there mm-hmm. and i think the commission would have a lot of, a lot of uh, impact on that a lot of, if if they wanted if we wanted to put some money behind that mm-hmm. so um well in terms of activities and so on i'm gonna i'm gonna skip the details and move a little bit now on um 
the whole mess, which is the legal framework. I know there's another presentation later, so we might be saying, well, I hope not contradictory things, but uh, <laughs> it, uh, you never know, you never know. That's absolutely true. Well, in any case, well, here I'm trying more to to present what was the result of the study, although, of course, uh, well, it includes uh, considerations on on, on, the, on the current situation and on, the, on where we are now and opinions. So, as you know, the, the, there's this text, you all know that, from 2001, directive, which tried to put together um, copyright in Europe. It is very important to never forget copyright is strictly territorial. There's a parallel, well, two parallel battles on that, on that fact, and there, there's more and more pressure on making uh, copyright a pan-European that would have a huge impact on the film industry in many things. That's a parallel debate that some of us are involved with in trying to prevent that from happening, and I don't think that's going to happen for now. But that would have also an impact here, because, of course, if copyright was one single, if there was one single copyright title across the continent, well, that would change some of these things and harmonization would be easier. So perhaps from the educational perspective, it would be better from the film industry perspective, perspective and, and cultural diversity would not be good. But... It is part of the debate. So anyway, what we have now is, yes, 28 national territorial legal frameworks. As I say, most of us wanted to stay that way, territorial, but at the same time with a basic and clear harmonization about what is the content of those rights. But we are not looking, harmonization of the content of those rights is not the same as wanting a single copyright title for Europe. I'm not in support for that, and I don't think anyone wanting cultural diversity would be supporting that. It harmonizes that directive from 2001, harmonizes essentially the right of reproduction, the right of making available to the public, and the right of communication to the public. And then it establishes, in Article 5.3, the directive establishes, and here's where the complication starts, uh, a limitation for educational uses, which means the an exception to the right Copyrights are, in fact, private rights of monopoly. That is what copyright is about, hmm? same as patent. You are allowed to do this. This is yours. This is granted to you, which means you can ban the use of this because the law gives that right to you. That's what copyright is about. Certain rights, as defined, allow you to prevent others from using that. And then you make exceptions and saying, well, in this case, or in this case, or in this case, you cannot prevent that from happening. That is what an exception to copyright is. Hmm? The law says, okay, we have granted this right of you to prevent doing a communication, to prevent doing a reproduction, to prevent doing that. And if somebody does, it needs to pay to you. If it doesn't, it can even be a criminal offense. But in this case, and this case, and this case, this right which we have, we, the law, have granted to you can have an exception. So you cannot prevent that from happening. This, in theory, is great. The problem is dual, and it's at the source of all the problems we have copyright in Europe in the educational field. First, if a certain activity it is unclear of whether it is protected or not by the right, well, it is unclear if it is protected or not by the exception. Very simple. If you don't know if the law protects you as a right holder, which means if you don't know if you can use it or not because you don't know if that right is protected and that is not well defined, then you don't know if the exception applies or not. You see? So it's a, it's, it's a complication, that. First point. Second point, which is intellectually, intellectually different. Of course, intertwined, but intellectually different. This exception to these rights, as far as it applies to education, is not compulsory which means each member state may or may not introduce the educational exception. And if they may, if, if they introduce the educational exception, they can design the educational exception slightly different from country to country. So it's like a three, three arrow, three directions mess. You don't know if certain activities are covered by the right, which then indirectly they will not be covered by the exception, because if they're not right, you don't need the exception to do something you can do in any case. Huh? 
Second, if there is the exception or not depends on the freedom of member states. And third, even when the exception has been implemented in member states, it has not been implemented exactly in the same terms. That's the mess which needs to be sorted out. The first, I, I will go a little bit more in detail, but <clears throat> to, to say what I would suggest here is that the first point which would be which make things much clearer is to make the exception mandatory for member states. So at least let's start cutting of these three uncertainties affecting this issue. Let's cut one, the easiest one. Hmm? Let's make it clear that every member state must introduce the educational exception. And there's no option to do it or not. Second, let's clarify, although it is a directive, so we cannot clarify 100%. No, directives cannot go to the full detail, otherwise they're not directives anymore, they would be regulation. Yeah? So as long as it remains a directive, you need to leave certain freedom to member states to develop the details of how, of how something is implemented. But still, there could be some wording in the directive, or there could be some wording in the non-legal part of the directive which helps to construct the directive, which is the introductory paragraphs, you know, the whereas more or less clarifying what is the impact of that exception, which would have been made mandatory, okay? So if those two issues were changed in the context of the new reform, which is gonna happen soon, of the, uh, starting in June, most probably, of the whole copyright legal framework, well, I think certain issues would be clearer. 100% clearer, no. 100% clearer, I don't think that will exactly happen because as much as this still happens on a European level, uh, sorry, on a national level in the way it needs to be implemented, um, certain things will still be decided differently in a country by country, but we would have advanced a lot. You know that, because it has been mentioned before, and many of you have, have been working with that, that it is essentially related to the concept of illustration. So the use of films is an illustration of something. Well, by definition, this should not be the full film. So the use of a full film, it is very difficult that it's going to be covered by the exception. Another thing is, and we will mention that, that it should have not an exception to copyright, but a specific framework for licensing for non-commercial activities, which is different. Let's not put everything in the same basket, okay? What you pay when you are doing a festival as licensing is not what you pay if you're going to put that on the Kinepolis or whatever, you know? So they might be, and they should be, and they are in some places, but that should be developed, licensing schemes for educational use. A licensing scheme for educational use should cover much better than they do, and in much clearer terms, the full use of films in an educational context, which would include cinematics and film archives and would include the use of films in schools. But this is different, although it is part of the same area, but it is technically completely different from the exception to copyright for the use of a piece of a film for illustration and content. You know? These are different, different things to deal with. And as every battle, if they are tackled separately, side by, part by part, I think it is much easier. Mm -hmm. So, when, I mean, the, the public performance is in principle, you know, um, not allowed. But of course, as, as I say, what is the public performance? So now we are going on the exception, okay? Of, on, not of the full film, but even of parts of the film for educational purposes. Hmm? What is a public performance? If there is a public performance, there is right to communication. There is no public performance, there's no public communication. So if there's no public communication, there's no right, and there's no right, there's no exception. Okay? So it's as simple as there's no exception there. So the problem is, and as a result in the study, that de depending on the interpretation that some member states do, a performance, so the showing up a film, excerpts of a film, you know, in a classroom can be considered or not a public performance. In some cases, it has been said that it very much depends on whether those receiving, those watching the film, know each other or not. Hmm? It's been written by a judge. So that means that in a classroom, 
as everybody in the classroom, they know each other, that is exactly the same as showing a film to your cousins or at home, which means that is not a public performance. That is a private performance. And if there's a private performance, there's no right to communication. If there's no right to communication, you don't need the exception. So it's not that the exception applies. Let me insist on that. Sorry, some of you are not lawyers and you might be less used to this sort of quadricular mentality of lawyers, okay? If there is no right to protect, there's no exception to the right. So if it is not the public communication, you don't need an exception to show a film in a Christmas party uh, with all your cousins and all the nephews and to watch uh, whatever, Benur there. I mean, you don't, need, you don't need an exception because there's no public communication. Well, that applies to the classroom in some cases. But if it is not the classroom, but it is the whole school, then you are into public communication. And therefore, for that to be legal, you have two ways. Or that is covered by the exception, or you need a license. If we are talking about the whole school. And that applies, I mean, then we need to see if the exception covers it or not. Does the exception cover the whole film? No, it doesn't. In most cases, it is constructed, it doesn't. A whole film is not an illustration, so it does not. A piece of a film, it does. So you don't need anything for an illustration because it is covered by the exception if you're using it there. But if it is the whole film, it is not covered, and then you need some sort of license, which then we move into the concept of educational licenses. Of course, those countries, and we go into the detail on that in our report, which have established serious and structured licensing for education, they don't care about the rest of the issues. Because the moment you have a license, you don't need to care if it's covered or not covered by the educational exception. You know, you have a licensing scheme for educational school, for educational structures, which is most, in most cases the Danish, uh, the, 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 the Scandinavian approach to this. Uh, is licensing for educational purposes, which is monitored and structured by the education institutions. And once you have that, well, you don't need to care that much whether this is covered or not covered or an exception, because you already have a legal umbrella to cover your activities. But when that doesn't happen, it is not clear. Hmm? So then there is, there is also another, another angle to this, which complicates things as well. Um, Online use, is it a public or not? Well, in some cases, so the educational limitation can be extended to online use in some countries. Belgium, Netherlands, France, Germany, Spain, and UK. So whatever the technology you're using, which means that it can be one day everybody in the same room or 10 times as much students, but along a week online, it if those accessing that content are covered by the exception, which is something else to check, the fact that that is online and that it is not everybody in the same room is not a problem. But that applies to those countries who have implemented that in those terms, technologically neutral, so online is covered. Hmm? But in other cases, and in particular in France, for example, the current interpretation in France is that online use, you can correct me if there's experience is different, but the theory is so it is, that online use is not covered by the exception. Hmm? So without a license, you can only use the educational exception for illustration, for showing of films as an exception to the right of communication if you are presential. If you try to do that online, then the exception doesn't, go, doesn't apply anymore. Hmm? So this is why the whole idea of developing and, and, and lobbying and structuring and promoting licensing schemes, it is important. A licensing scheme doesn't need to be a lot of money. It can be, first, it could be paid by public money directly. First, it could even be, I don't exactly support it, but let's be theoretically possible, it could be compulsory licensing for any film paid with public money, and then we return to your point. It could be, theoretically. You could see uh, public so licenses for educational purposes, uh, purposes are mandatory for any film which has received uh, public funding. That might have an indirect effect and might create some tensions because at the end, of course, you don't want the whole young audiences to go away, run away from cinemas and all just watching the films, you know, for free because, you know, some films, well, we might have an issue here. But, uh, yeah, but that's an issue which would... 
Yes, yes, but then then probably the public money which has been put the let me put it this way and I, as a public manager as a as a previous manager of a public fund I can tell you huh? when you're putting money in a film you're expecting that part of that money is going to be recovered. If you put the money in the film expecting that it is not going to be recovered because a large part of it is going to be given for free, then you better put more money in the film because then you can have the film. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Theatrical is done, as you know. Theatrical is just going to be for fun and for a few experts in a few times. So theatrical is not the way to recover. The money of films is going to be recovered online. Uh, it's theatrical. You cannot count on the theatrical recovery of film anymore. Uh, as, as Spielberg said uh, recently in a joint interview together, Spielberg and, and George Lucas uh, talking together, and they know a little bit about the film industry uh, and about the future tendencies, you know, uh, theatrical releases are going to be like the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Uh, theat real, real theatrical, not going to cinema tech. Real theatrical is going to be like a Super Bowl. It's something you do with your family one day and you pay and you invite people and you have an amazing experience there. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not it's not going to be the normal channel for this. But then we, we can discuss this. this. It is interesting that you raise that because it affects this whole description. You cannot, we cannot discuss educational use for cinema without understanding that this is happening in the middle of an amazing tsunami. Mm -hmm. And this is, and of course, it, it would be a bit hypocritical or a bit naive from, from the side of anybody interested in film education to think of this, forgetting what is going on on the consumption of audiovisual content by those children and youth, what is going on with the very films, what is Netflix, what is happening, what is the funding of the, this? This is the whole picture. And we are, meaning we interested people in film education, we are part of that picture. An essential part, a very important part, and a part which is going important, but a part. So the moment the whole business model changes, <clears throat> we cannot pretend to set up a film education scheme as if we were in the 60s with films released in 35 millimeters and with a window of exploitation and money recovered. That is not with the world we are in. <laughs> so we need, to, we need to consider all this. And this, of course, has an impact in public uh, money put on films, it has an impact on film distribution, and it has an impact on the whole, in everything which is around. So anyway, there are different solutions to this, and I'm finalizing this, uh, about clarifying the licensing. So we need to clarify the exception, which will rarely apply to the full films, and we need to clarify the licensing for educational uses. Mm -hmm. So there might be mandatory remuneration which uh, uh, for <clears throat> so framework agree agreement for um, for licensing, which is happening in some cases and it's very better developed. In other cases, it is an extensive collective licensing, as in the Scandinavian countries. I mean, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. They have a specific uh, aspect there at the national uh, national level. There could be nothing prevents, and it's something in theory we should be recommending to have local authorities or regional authorities whoever is them I mean, in you in spain i can think it could be the regional authorities autonomous communities here it could probably be the land to do all those licensing as well it would be perfectly feasible and to be doing a licensing scheme for educational purposes for all the schools uh, in that area that's something which could be perfectly lobbied for and it shouldn't cost them money and it's not about the money it's about having the possibility to deal with that because we cannot expect every single school to be doing their own licensing of course, this can be combined, like in brackets, you know, a footnote, uh, or needs to be differentiated by the direct licensing which happens when a school in itself pays for a VOD or SVOD access to film, which might, in some cases, simplify it a lot. So if a school has its own subscription its own subscription to an online film distributor, a public one. I mean, a uh, Eurovot, Universine in France, a film in, uh, of course, Apple TV and so on, but, but let's think mostly about European or independent content, uh, all those. When a school, as such school, signs that, well, it can be seen. It might be that there is an exception for using a larger, and if that is not considered uh, totally public, well, it can be done, you see? So you will need to check 
the terms of that specific agreement. In fact, I do know that some of those, I know Universine did that for a while, I know filming in Spain is doing that, uh, uh, that's still open, so I'm not that sure what's going on in other countries, and we did not go, go in the report in the detail of that, we just opened that as a, as a clarification, that some of these platforms do offer films for schools with special conditions. So in that case, that legally is covered by the license. The very fact of purchasing that download or download is mostly streaming is in itself a license which simplifies everything. Of course, we need to relate this with the technical situation in schools. If the school just has a modem with a thing, well, then you cannot be watching films on, uh, on streaming, of course. So, so that cannot be generalized across Europe for now. Um, so recommendations which came out of this of this report. Um, first, of course, we recommended the, to recognize film literacy as a compulsory subject because it would make all these issues much much easier to deal with. Um, issues related to awareness, issues related to training of teachers, uh, support for teachers to dealing with this. Then we strongly supported, and I think of course that is is going on, but more could be done to promote, to create, to fund uh, pan-European or at least coordinated European uh, VOD as VOD platform for educational purpose. So that's something which would simplify this a lot. What I was just saying that is actually happening because some online distributors are doing that, <clears throat> that could be done in a much more structured way and to have a certain amount of uh, of, of films uh, which are which are paid for by educational authorities or which are even paid by schools very simply uh, or are paid by educational authorities there and are given at a very much much lower price by by those distributors and which are available for schools for a certain period that would simplify a lot the the use of full films I'm insisting not excepts covered by education but full films at this level mm -hmm. and of course the commission for the cost of one of these uh, projects. For that same cost once a year, they could be perfect buying the licenses. So that's if you add the figures, the cost of each one of these reports, our report, your report, you put that in a license and you have licenses for schools for, for because that's what we're talking about. So it is it is it is something which is at some moment to stop putting money into analysis and analysis and analysis that one day stop putting money into results. But that's uh, something we, we already told the European Commission. Then, of course, there's a role which could be developed much further uh, by public service broadcasters. Uh, many European films have funding from public service broadcasters and that is not, uh, they also have a public service role in terms of film literacy and film education and they are not fulfilling. They are not fulfilling it. Huh? They are part of the right holders we are discussing are public service broadcasters. So they have a role to play. Uh, of course, the use of school libraries and so on. We 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 develop that as a as a recommendation, and we uh, discuss the possibility of of making raising the awareness of the different licensing opportunities which exist, and of course building new ones when they don't exist. But those which are which exist, they should be much clearer explained to those uh, responsible in, in schools. And with this, this was with the report. I joined the report with a little bit of, of, of opinions of what's going on now. And I to, to, to end where I started, the commission is gonna put forward a, a total or very serious review of, of copyright in June, which has to do with many issues. Uh, but it would be good that it is, is also part of that and, this, and that this debate is open because, you know, reforming the directive is something that happens. It's like building a new airplane, you know. You design a new airplane uh, every 20 years, uh, or a new rocket, and then whatever happens in the next year in copyright will stay for the next 15 years. So we better, we better use this opportunity now. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for all your recommendations. Uh, I take a lot of notes and I think we will have a discussion now because I, I feel there is <laughs> some, yeah, some, some need. So I give my mic to the bank leader. Mm, first of all, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for this deep uh, insight of also what's going behind the screens. 
And but I have one question. Are we sure that we are talking about the same issue, the same topic? I mean, when we are talking about film literacy, we always mean film for film as an art a form, a film in its entire um, being. We are not talking about uh, illustrating or illustration purposes for other lessons and other topics, be it literature or be it, I mean, really literature, uh, books, uh, uh, historical events and developments or wars or whatsoever. When we are talking about film liter literacy as we do, we always mean the film as such, the work, the work which is protected as such, uh, an art form or a um, model of uh, pop popular culture. So when we are talking now about, okay, these and that exceptions under these and that uh, circumstances, conditions, licensing, or, 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 you, we, we were not talking about the entire film, full length film, which can only be 10 minutes or whatsoever. We are not talking about the work, but then we have to talk about film literacy. Well, yes and no. <laughs> no, I mean, don't kill the messenger. Uh, but yes and no also for the European Commission. So what you say does not exactly correspond to the reality for whoever discusses film literacy in Europe. No one. Uh, it, is, it is an ideal, but it is not a reality. Well, I'm, not, I'm just explaining how things go there. I mean, when the Commission talks film literacy, it is actually including the use of film for other educational purposes. To say that this is not enough, to discuss it as, as it being too poor, to promote that other uses, and, 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 and of course when we are saying that, uh, and the Commission is saying, and we recommend it, well the Commission is not saying it formally, but lots of people are saying that film literacy should be part of the curricula, it is exactly in the line of what you're saying. So I totally agree that this is what we should be talking about. Film, you teach film as you teach literature. So you teach these films and these films, and, uh, totally correct, totally correct. <laughs> totally agreed but this is not we can we can do two things and i insist that let's not kill the messenger stop discussing this until that happens and then not a single seminar and not a single project or in between deal with what is out there and what is out there and this this report just proves it and of course the commission that's why the commission charges is that 90 percent of the use of film in schools now is not what you are saying and is not what should be, it's ancillary. So the King's speech is used in a class of English or in, uh, in, the, in uh, the language or in a class of whatever, of social thing of history. Will it just be illustrating the King's speech or they will just use the opportunity also to talk about the importance of why that film is that? And that applies to Les Intouchables, <clears throat> it applies to the Van Gogh, whatever, you know? A film on Van Gogh is going to be teaching the art class. And if we wait until we only have people discussing cinema as such, well, it's a little, it's a totally legitimate option, but I can tell you this is not what is happening in Europe. I can calm you down. We are not waiting. We are very active. <laughs> and also we know the whole picture, like Netflix and so on. Don't worry. Klaus, <laughs> please, from the Danish Film Institute. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Ignasi. Um, well, I'm Mr. Jor. I'm from the Danish Film Institute. I'm head of um, Children and Youth. Um, and I'm also a part of a European network. Uh, the EFAT group has set down a working group on film education, which is also covering this aspect on copyright. Uh, it's chaired by BFI and I'm the vice chair of this group and this is the reason why I'm here. And to get to the point here, in this group we have two, um, we have two strands so far in our work. We have only had one working meeting. One is film education. What is film education in the 21st century? Um, and we try to connect based on what has already been done 
the framework for film education in your pan-European work already done and try to connect that to a more broader media literacy agenda because what people are talking about in Brussels and everywhere is 21st century skills. It's about uh, media competences and so on. And we think that film is in the, at the heart of this debate in this group. This is one thing. Another thing is the copyright issue. And you talked about what should we actually go for when we are when the European Commission are trying to change the copyright framework for the future, seen from the educational perspective. Um, and you were talking about a compulsory licensing statement or something like that in, in a new directive given that the film has more or less public money uh, in, uh, in, in the financing. And I'm, I'm thinking, I think it's, in theory, it's a very good idea. But if you look into it, what should it actually, the directive, what should it actually say about this? Should it say that the licensing model should have, for example, hold back for the film so it could explore its commercial potential before it goes into education? Should it have, uh, um, what about the window structure and so on? What should it actually say if we go in that direction? Or should we go in another direction saying that this is an issue, this is not because we already had the exception. This is not a legal issue. It's more like that we should come up with models for the future which are actually arranged in such a way that it also uncovers the new uh, streaming platforms and so on. So are we going in the legal direction in, in our lo lobby work or are we going in another direction or should we take both directions when we talk about copyright? Thank you very much. That's, that's extremely interesting because of course I'm a very pragmatic person and I like when all these ideas and debates and you might imagine it's not the first time attending uh, materialize into an action plan, you know, something very precise to sort things out. And we need to decide, and especially those of you, I mean, uh, the effort working group, you need to decide exactly what is the target, what is it that you're going to fight for, and that is what you need to plan. So the, the question is, is clear. My personal opinion is, I'm first, I'm not an enthusiastic of mandatory licensing. I mentioned this as a possibility because I want to be neutral in my presentation. It is a possibility, it is feasible, huh? but I'm not particularly supportive of that because I think it would create a tension with the film industry and the educational community, if I can put it that way. And we don't want that tension. We need everybody on the same board. So I'm not particularly in favor of that. But if that was a line to follow, in no case I would propose that being done in the copyright directive. No, absolutely not, even in legal terms. I mean, I, we could, I can be very much technical legally, I won't, not, not to uh, distract you too much, but I don't think that would be done. If the idea of a mandatory licensing for educational purposes takes shape, that should be done, if, for example, in the new cinema communication, which allows for public funding of cinema and fixes the criteria for public funding of cinema and the limits for public funding of cinema. And there, which is a communication, not a directive, but it is the framework, which is, and that is the Bible, that document is the Bible for every single national film agency for the efforts, you know, that's the Bible for the efforts when they are funding. There could be something they are saying that member states, when they are funding cinema, they are allowed, let's even leave it that way, they are allowed to impose mandatory licensing of those publicly funding films, funded films, for educational purposes. That would be a way... That, that would be a way to, to, to do that, you know, to link the public funding with that. But that is not copyright. That's, I mean, it has an impact. It's, it's another, another completely different approach. And at the end, efforts could be doing that by an internal resolution. Huh? You don't even know that. N need a full thing. If efforts decide to start recommending or to look into that, that's okay. So I would not turn the copyright directive into something which deals into mandatory licensing at all. Uh, the, the other part... Do we need to change something in the copyright directive? Yes. I would mention two things. I mentioned those before. First, the educational exception, even if it is for excerpts, not for the full film, but it has an importance, should be mandatory in that case, 
among member states. So every member state should have in its own national legislation and we would stop having some member states having it or not first. And second, and that should also be somewhere in the directive, it should be technologically neutral. It should, be, it should apply when it applies. It should apply independently on whether that is shared with people uh, simultaneously present in a room or it is shared by people accessing an online, uh, an intranet of a school. Hmm? It should be the same to show a film or to show something with a piece of, uh, with some images in the internet of the school that to share that in the, in the main auditorium of the school. That is not the case now, or at least it's open to interpretation. So technologically neutral and mandatory. That's the maximum, which would be already a big change that I would make in the, in the copyright directive. Just a comment about the cinema communication. I think AC tried six years ago, and they did succeed, to include this for film heritage. So there is the link between public funding and film heritage. So if a film is publicly funded, film heritage institutions should be allowed to use it for non-commercial purposes. That is already the case, but not educational. That yeah, is but with, yes, non-commercial education. For no. us, it's the kind of same... Yeah, but it can be used by you, but not by schools. I know the law. Yeah. So what, what we have now in the cinema communication, mm -hmm. and it's the law in most countries, is that national film archives, and that can be extended to non-national film archives, but it is in principle for national film archives, can use for non-commercial purposes film, which is essentially film heritage and, and, and promotion of the country's image and so on, uh, films publicly funded. But that does not apply to schools across the country at all. There's no legal basis for that. But Ignacy, you were also talking about, instead of trying to go the legal way, you talked about we should put something in the various section yes. in the directive. So what yeah. you're talking about here is intentions more than a new legal framework. Well, the where is and, of and, I, and what I know about the cinema communication, it has, it's from 2013, and next time we see a new one is seven, ten years, hopefully, yeah. because it's a mess changing that. So what we could do in the where section is to say that it should be allowed, if we make the exception more precise on education, it should be allowed, and the commission should have the obligation to dig into this, how can we actually create licensing models which are suitable for, the, for, for educational purposes in the, in the future? It, sh it could be done like that instead of saying that now we have all the legal discussions. It's, you could put it in there in, uh, instead, I'm thinking. We, we can discuss that. Thanks. I don't think the whereas, I think the whereas of a directive can have a huge impact, but it must always refer to what is in the directive itself. Uh, but what you're saying is true, and of course, that's, uh, there's a role for efforts, there's a role for the Association of uh, European Cinematics into forcing the Commission to do things. The Commission has a huge capacity to do things outside the law, not against the law, but outside pure changing law, you know, to promote licensing models, to put people around the table to discuss new models, to put some money for license to be offered, like templates. There could be a European template for license. It could be online. It could be for everybody to just download it in its own language. The Commission can do that tomorrow if they want. And this is not legal. This is things they do in many other areas, you know. So if the Commission wants to facilitate the life of the education environment, they can do many things. And they're not doing them. Among other things because, you know, they have different interests. And that is not changing the law. This is actually doing things. Eventually, a you're, you're right. They are, the cinema communication took a huge time and it's not going to be changed. There could be another communication on film and schools. They could be doing that tomorrow. And that would have the same level and it would have all, uh, many of these elements on, on putting there, you know. That, that's what the Commission does. A, commu a communication on what should be done, what could be done, a recommendation for member states, a name and shame. Commission uses the name and shame method for many issues. Name and shame means, okay, you list which countries are effectively doing this and which ones are not. And no country and no Ministry of Education finds comfortable to be named as somebody who is not promoting film literacy. Well, 
you're doing that with many areas. I mean, the commissioner is doing that in many areas. I'm saying, I've been working in the EU first for 20 years, so sorry for putting that on myself, but I mean, on, 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 on a wide range of areas. Huh? There's a lot which can be done beyond changing Article X in a directive. So you can touch a little bit the directive, and I'm strongly recommending that, but that's not, not much more than the directive itself, you know, because, because that means vote in Parliament, men have votes, the Council discussing. It's very complicated to touch the directive and you have a lot of people. But the Commission itself, without the Council, without the Parliament, could be doing much, much more in this area. I have an, but even if we would opt for a compulsory licensing scheme, we are not uh, schools, so we are cinematechs from heritage institutions. Would we fit under this educational establishment umbrella or not? In the licensing? No, in the whole discussion, if we would like to, yes, also in the licensing. In the licensing, for sure. In the, in the educational exception, no, I don't think you fit. That's, that's, uh, I don't think that the, in the way things are now, and in the way, again, don't kill the messenger, in the way I expect or imagine things to be, I don't see uh, film uh, archives and, and cinematechs being considered for these purposes as pure educational institutions for the purpose of the use of the, of the educational exception. I do see that there's absolutely space for the film archives to be covered by licenses for educational purposes. That can be done. And that would just mean it can be done. And in fact, it is. It is now. It can be now the case when film archives are part of these larger uh, um, film literacy projects in Belgium. Some, some we know, and uh, a different project which are happening there, which put together schools and archives and film clubs and all that. The licenses which are behind that are not normal licenses for commerce purposes. Are licenses for educational purposes. So that's perfectly feasible, and that can be developed much further sure okay but now from your point of view could you just give us some suggestion of what to let all those happen i mean w from which point we we have to start uh, lobby uh, into europe uh, we our national uh, bodies suggestion i mean we are here to no. asking you for your help First, when Claudia is not here anymore, you, you need to, so I don't want to interact if she's not here, she cannot reply, but um, there's a philosophical question you need to discuss among yourselves. If you really agree, I don't, I, mean, I said it with a lot of respect, huh? if you really agree that you are only concerned, only interested and only affected by the use of full films for full thing, well, then you should stop talking about educational exception because it's not your business anymore. It's not your business. That's it. It's not part of your analysis. It's not what you've been discussing. And let's just uh, save a lot of time because you have nothing to do with educational exception because that is only of illustration for educational purposes. So if you're interested in that, it is because you're interested in all this thing, which Claudia said, it is not what we're talking about. This is This is... This we, is an analysis you should do. <laughs> I mean, we are, we are interested in both. No, that's what I mean. But it's uh, I of need to say we are it. interested in both. I need to say so. If <laughs> if that if you're interested in both, that you, you which I think you should. But I, it was said, uh, then you need to make a difference between reinforcing and clarifying the scope of the educational exception, which will not benefit you as film archives directly but will benefit your constituency, if I can use it, that language, so it benefits schools, it benefits activities you are part of, it helps you to train teachers, so it is part of your environment, even if you will not affect a film shown in this room, huh? it, will, it is part of that, so what could you be doing? Well, talk to educational authorities, try to do this lobbying about making it clear that online is also covered, uh, training teachers, of course, developing the clarification of what is public screening and not public screening, that, that sort of clarification needs to be done, and that, that part. And then in parallel, the licensing thing. And on the licensing, what could you be doing? Well, uh, with the commission, for them to push things at the European level, but that's not for each one of you, but for the European uh, lobbying to do that, you know? And then at the national level, yes, to have a set of licensing models. There's not one. 
they are different. You can look at what is going on in Denmark and, and uh, in Scandinavia. That's for me the model. How much of that can be replicated? Nothing can ever be totally replicated, but, but it is a model to look at. They do have licensing schemes which schools can jump in. So, and, and, and of course, and film archives can jump in. And if so, you have that and you could be building that. Sorry. So, Florina, hmm? please. Um, yeah, we were talking about films used as illustration, but film education in our case is not only, or uh, especially not only, uh, using film as illustration. It's the topic of the education. And that's why we work with, um, well, small parts of films, but also with complete films, uh, short films, uh, short films you can uh, basically show uh, completely in class or in our venues. So we use film in a very, uh, in a broader way than only illustration. Yeah. And I think that is very important to stress out today because that's the only way um, we are thinking about uh, this right issue. It's like the complete package. Yes, but that's you're reopening the issue, and again, I need to say, don't kill the messenger. The way the directive is the, is written, and the way it's implemented across the whole of Europe, the educational exception does not cover the screening of full film. Full stop. This is what it is. The only country in the whole of Europe will the, where the, a full film can be considered covered by the educational exception is Malta. In Malta, yes. Let's the way it is drafted, you can <laughs> say that a full film is covered by the educational exception. Nowhere else. So the educational exception is, is, is only talking about films using uh, as an illustration, not yes. as the topic of the, the Well, as an education. illustration, but of course it can be an illustration or a lesson for films, so that would not be a problem. It can be an illustration for a, for a course on English, or it can be an illustration on a course on film. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the problem. Yeah. Uh, no, but, the, the problem is that it cannot be the there full is film. A dif <laughs> yeah, there is a difference, of course, because if you use it in English, then it is obvious that it's more an illustrative uh, tool. But in the, the, the lessons about film, it's not an illustration only. It is more. Well, it is more, but the law, the law doesn't say it needs to be only or not only. That you are adding that, but yeah. it, it just says that it cannot be the full film. So it can be. You you can do a full. If if tomorrow, uh, Germany or a land, I don't know if a land alone can have the freedom to do that, or the whole of Germany introduces a history of cinema or cinema understanding uh, as as a subject in schools, and you have a full. Uh, you know, trimester, trimester on, on the Italian uh, neorealism, you know, uh, made compulsory and mandatory, well, you can use films there by the education exception, but you cannot use the full film. You can only use excerpts of Rosalini. <laughs> okay. And also what you said about uh, showing in a classroom everybody knows each other, that was also... At Germany. No, no, I mean, you before in your presentation yeah, we were talking... That's yeah, it's in Germany. Germany. That, that depend, right. Well, okay, that that's, that's what, what I, I say. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Depending so, on the this country, is a whole film, depending. For no, no, yeah, the whole. All on also the the excerpts mm. can be used or not in a full class, depending exactly. on whether that yeah. is considered full, uh, mm. private or not. What class you wanted to? Well, I'm just trying to develop an argument because in the old, uh, this, before we went digital, it was possible for a teacher at least in Denmark to buy. Uh, DVD in the shop and show it to the students in the classroom. It was possible in Denmark. It was possible in the and terms, it was done in the and, terms and, it and there was a lot of available uh, films and so on because everybody knew each other in the classroom and it was a private thing. And I think we have some comments on the Danish legislation on copyright saying that if you are more than 40 people in a room, it's a public screening. If you are less than 40 people, um, then exactly. it's something more or less private. Okay. Now in the digital world, we need we need to buy the films to act just to make them uh, accessible, because you need to provide them at the streaming service. Given that the streaming service is public for educational purposes, behind logins and so on. Okay, and what I'm thinking here is thinking the positive way around. It should be in the in the interest from the industry to enter into dialogue with the educational frameworks. Yes in order to clarify what is up and down here, what, how, how much money is actually 
uh, in this uh, environment for if your film was to be bought for educational purposes. So everybody, all stakeholders, need clarification because I think that from the educational side, we should not say that, well, we should have your film for free or something like that because that's never going to happen. But we should say we are in this together finding models to do it. Couldn't agree more. Uh, and, uh, and I think a, a legal framework for that in a new copyright directive saying that this is the way forward. But you don't need a legal framework to say that there are licenses working. I think for we need it. If you, if, if you say all. that the, the line today about educational uh, exception is only for illustration, not the whole film, then we need some kind of anchor in the legal framework to do this kind of negotiations yeah, with the industry. No. Thank you. Yeah, I agree on your description, on the diagnose. On the remedy, it's simpler. Nothing prevents the industry and the education community to create a business model of licensing. You don't need the law change for that. That's what I'm saying. So that's what I'm saying, that you don't, you don't need to, in fact, it would be even dangerous to enter into opening a, a legal debate uh, on, on what the industry can and cannot do. Because the industry, the last thing they want is to have something imposed. Even if they're going to do the same thing, the industry never the wants that being imposed by law. You know, that's a principle for the industry. So what you're describing is totally feasible. The Commission could play a role in doing this at the pan-European level. And of course, it can be done at a national level. And then yeah, I, I kind of percent agree. There is a lot of room for much better understanding between the industry and the educational community about what can be done, what can be done, and that's contract-based. Those are licenses. Those are licenses which can be applied not only to one school, but to the whole, all of schools of the country or of a region. That's, that's collective licensing mechanism. And depending on the country, that can be done through collecting societies, or it can be done because not, not all countries have the same system. But if in Spain you do that through the producers collecting society, for example, well, you have one licensing model which would cover all the, all the schools in the country, for example. Uh, in France it might be different, but you do that with the SSD and you have that. So I, I completely understand. But what I'm thinking here is that maybe it's not a completely legal uh, thing I'm talking about. It's about saying that now we have the opportunity, giving the discussion on the digital single market, giving the discussions on copyright, the opportunity to say to say to our politicians, we need you to push us and the industry in a in a special direction. How to do this for yes. the future, yes. for for film literacy and media literacy in the future, and maybe it's not about how should how should we formulate a, a, a specific section in a directive. It's more about them saying, we need you to go in together in the same room, solve yes. this out. Yes. And, and totally I think agree. the opportunity is, <laughs> is here. And I also think we need some kind of how to, to make this pressure. Uh, and maybe it's not the copyright directive in, in itself and the, the sections in the copyright directive, but it's, we have the opportunity now. And how to do that, lobbying that. Well, we I need the pressure. Ideas, Thank but, uh, you. <laughs> that, we agree on that. We 100% agree, not on the corporate directive, but yes, there's a space for the commission to be involved in that. And there's a lobbying exercise which is not being done now. Uh, and if you want you know, even more the detail, well, people in the commission who are involved in film literacy are not exactly the most powerful people in the commission right now. So, so for this to happen, uh, you will need to involve, I mean, Commissioner Oettinger and the Vice President Nancy, and for them to understand what this is about. And at the same time, not to raise enemies from moment one, to make clear that this is not about having films for free, that this is not about creating new obligations by law, because if you start doing that, you will have enemies popping up like mushrooms immediately. Uh, uh, but this is about building together film education in the 21st century, in the digital single market, and trying to find a model that helps everybody. And if that is built, and I'm not that effort, I'm not that asset, that's, that's, that's the, the work of, of others. Huh? Uh, if that is done, and of course the parliament has a role on that, not the decision power, but it could be playing a role, of course members of parliament understand this much better. There's, there's a very heavy political case to make, and I think that there's a lot of it can be done which is not being done. I think... This is what ACN has been doing for years, talking to the rights holders, talking to the industry. We try to make them understand that there's a difference between heritage films, old films, and actual productions, heritage films which are out of distribution, 
very often. But this doesn't change their mind. They they don't see any difference, and at least there's no uh, proceedings in this I don't, discussion. <laughs> I don't completely agree. I mean, for, I, I think that this will only succeed, but this is a personal opinion, and I'm, I'm always very direct in what I think, you know, that's a... Uh, if at least the first movement includes heritage films and others, this this needs to be a joint a joint venture. Okay, this cannot be just the battle of heritage films, because it's too weak. In the total picture, that's too weak. That's not strong enough for people to be motivated, especially those who are not like any of us passionate of films and who are not understanding. So I'm not saying you need to suddenly talk to Disney. I'm not saying that. No? I'm not mentioning the Disney word here. No. Huh? It's fine. We don't have. I, I personally, I don't have a problem no, with. Well, this. but I mean, but I'm not. I'm not going that far. But I'm just saying this is about film in education, and it starts with heritage, and it has yeah, listen to Chablo, which is which is not exactly heritage film, you know, and it has an amazing uh, dimension. So uh, part of Disney is also heritage. Mm, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, but also, but even if we restrict to European, so I think this needs to be a larger, a larger effort. Part of which is that so. Of course, film archives had a huge, have a huge play, a huge, huge function here. Mm? Uh, and without them, this cannot work. And uh, without you, this cannot work. This is clear. But we cannot reduce the presence of film in schools across the continent to heritage films. Because if we do that, or if it looks as if we are doing that, well, then it's very difficult to get the College of Commissioners or a commissioner of the European Parliament supporting this as something which is changing the educational landscape, you know? But we are also organizing school film projects with yeah. contemporary films, so no, no, we have a broad... I, I know it is in practical terms, of course it is, mm -hmm. of course it is. But I'm just saying that all these things need to be, or could be, perhaps better connected. Okay, time is fleeting, so um, thank you very much again also for the lively discussion. <laughs> Um, I s normally in the schedule now Lisette's uh, presentation I think we need five minutes I don't know do you agree yes but really five minutes please but lunch is waiting afterwards so five minutes and be back thank you